Você já chegou a não me ligar. A treinar? <risos> Tá que ver como não? Já está lá em cima, para não ficar Þá ætti ég að geta smelt. Já, við erum alltaf að leita fleiri tjálfbóðlöðu. Hann endilega að ykkur hefur eitthvað segja að við erum með þá þá erum að senda okkur post á tíma að það segja upp Andrés. Við erum bráðum að fara að vinna í að gera hérna þessi sætt síðu. Og hann á að skúma eftir ef að fólk vill vera með greinar og þannig að endilega að senda á okkur. Við erum búin að þetta um aðeins greina að ruglaða staðsetningur þarna og það geta aðeins breyst. En plan er að vera með tíu eða þá tíu mánuðum. Við erum búin með núna síðan í september, oktober og nóvember og núna með desember. Svo við verðum eitthvað skemmtilegt í janúar. Þetta er ekki alveg nefnt niður þessi sérsætt línurnar. Það er endilega að koma með hugmyndir um þetta bara svona sem komið er. Það er aðeins meira inn í þessu að þrýst að sveim og það er allt í lagi að hafa eitt sólistjæm átt af því að það er í raun í grunn. Og hérna við erum náttúrulega, eins og þetta er í fyrsti skipti sem við erum náttúrulega að koma með til þessara hingað. Það er þetta að það er sem að og þannig að núna þess að þetta byrjar að rúla svona að sé ákvörð, það er það kannski aðeins meiri möguleika að vera að flytja inn svona hverja stilfinga eða er eitthvað svona ákvæði Þá var um að gera þess að segja, bara að láta okkur vita. Þeir sem er núna er Fríkó og Gústaf. Þeir eru báður í Black Belt í Microsoft og hann er búin að vera lengi í bransanum. Það er bara að leiða ekki þeim að komast að. Þetta er smá lagi í þessu. En það er svona gerist víst. Og já, hann sé, ef það er einhverjar hugmyndum með efni og því er líkt sem að Þeir langt að hafa það endur að koma því á okkur. En annars bara spurnum að gefa frík bara gott klapp og það er eitthvað hann að segja. Ok, mjög að velkomin. Svo það er mjög að stafa að kontrólla. Þú segir hann að alveg að þetta við þeim? Wow. All right. All good. Still recording. Okay, thank you uh, for joining. And uh, thank you for having me uh, today. Um, today we're going to talk about Windows uh, Virtual Desktop uh, on Azure. And uh, I'm excited to be here because uh, Windows Virtual Desktop made it into uh, um, general availability. Can you see your Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was already shared. Uh, yeah, I probably took over my mental demand session. Yeah. Thank yep. you. <laughs> Good. So Windows for your desktop made it into uh, general availability two months uh, ago, and uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of interest. A lot of um, people want to uh, start using this uh, service. So um, today I want to take you through the service to just share some of the um, the uh, announcement that I made in uh, Ignite, but also take you through the entire service. So what does it mean from an admin from a user uh, perspective? We'll talk about that. And uh, so my name is Craig Bersel, I'm from the Netherlands. I uh, work for a consulting company there, uh, doing mostly RDS, VDI, 
um, related uh, projects, consultancy, architecture uh, jobs, and uh, mostly on Azure today uh, as well. Uh, have been a Microsoft MVP on this topic for many uh, years, and uh, well, I enjoy sharing this knowledge with uh, community groups like this, but also larger uh, events. So um, let's get started. So before we start, does anyone remember this? Who worked with this operating system? A lot of people here. So this is Windows uh, NT uh, 4.0 Terminal Server Edition. So this was one of the first operating systems allowing you to publish applications, or in this case, the full desktop, to multiple users at the same time. So this is when sort of the terminal services uh, was born. So this was about 20 years uh, ago, uh, but the, te the, te the technology itself stayed the same, right? We're still publishing desktops and applications to the end user. Hopefully the experience changed a bit over the 20 years, and hopefully your desktop is not looking uh, like this. Uh, but let's make uh, a shift 20 years uh, later to uh, some of the scenarios why we are doing remoting Windows uh, in the first place. And the first one is really about security. So how do I make sure that uh, an employee or user who uh, access my application and consumes the data within an application that that data does not end up on the local device? Something that remoting can Windows uh, can do for you. Uh, the second one is about elastic workplace, so uh, flexibility. How do I make sure that uh, when new users come in that they are provided with a desktop or a set of applications in a fast and efficient way uh, for mergers or acquisitions or uh, short-term employees, for example? And the third one is really about specific employees. So some of your employees might not even own a corporate device anymore. So how do you make sure that applications and desktops end up on those bring your own devices or choose your own devices in a secure and good way? And the last one is uh, all about specialized workloads. And that's the one that I see uh, the most, especially the legacy apps. So although many application vendors are transforming their application into a modern app or an app from an app store or an HTML5 application, there are still millions of Windows applications out there. So how do you make sure that those Windows applications are not stopping you from moving to the modern workplace, which is all about bring your own and Windows 10 and Intune devices, et cetera. So these are some of the scenarios where remoting Windows uh, is used, not only specifically for the Microsoft world, this also applies to Citrix, VMware, or any other third party who is doing similar stuff. So if we know what the uh, what the use cases are, some of the common use cases, what are the options when you take a look at the Microsoft perspective? First of all, we have uh, remote desktop services based on an IaaS model, so infrastructure as a service, which means that we're hosting virtual machines and on top of that, we're hosting an entire remote desktop services um, deployment. So managing virtual machines, uh, but also making sure that you back them up that you load balance them, that you make them highly available. So this is all about an IaaS model. We've been using that for many years, and it's also available in Azure if you still want to do that. Mostly if you want to have full control over your environment, if you want to make sure that you have, um, that you can do heavy customization or branding in that environment, that you have full access to all of the components within that environment, you can still choose this option. Anyone who has experience with remote desktop services in general? Okay, so you're probably aware of, about these uh, scenarios. So the new one is Windows Virtual Desktop. So why would you want to do that if you do not want to manage all of these infrastructure roles? If you do uh, not want to focus on all of the infra, but rather focus on the user experience and focus on the uh, applications and the way the users act with those applications. If you want to have Microsoft manage all of those components for you, then Windows Virtual Desktop is ideal. It also comes with Windows 10 Enterprise Multi-Session, which is the first client operating system allowing you to have multiple users connect to it at the same time and share resources similar to a RDS or terminal server environment, only available on Azure. And it allows you to bring Windows 7 even to Azure. So if you still have an application who, uh, that doesn't run on Windows 10, you can still run it on Windows 7, bring it to Azure and get three years of extended support because you are running it in Azure. So these are the options, and um, let's take a brief look at how we used to do remote desktop services in an IaaS model. So this is based on Windows Server 2019, but it also somewhat applies to 2016 and even 2012 uh, R2 back then. 
So this is the infrastructure uh, slide, and you see that most of the components are uh, in these white boxes, meaning that these are infrastructure as a service. So these are virtual machines that you need to manage, maintain, update, and these are running in your own Azure subscription. A couple of components have already transformed into a platform as a service model. So we're leveraging the Azure Key Vault to store SSL certificates for this environment. We're using the Azure SQL database instead of having to run our own uh, SQL Server database on top of Azure. And we're using Azure AD. So a couple of components have already shifted to a platform as a service model, but for the most part, this is all about IaaS. This is all about VMs in Azure. On the left hand side, you have the uh, various clients. So even with these, uh, with this setup, you have access to uh, Windows, but also iOS, macOS, Android, and even HTML5 clients to be able to access the applications and desktops published to the end user. Let's now make a transition to Windows Virtual Desktop because this was announced uh, September 30. And this is the, uh, the public announcement that Brad Anderson uh, did where he said Windows Virtual Desktop is now generally available worldwide. It is not, not really worldwide. Uh, this is sort of a marketing uh, statement. Uh, yes, the service is accessible from all of the world, uh, but they are still working on getting the Windows Virtual Desktop in each of the Azure uh, regions. So we'll talk about what it exactly means uh, and which regions are uh, available already today in an upcoming uh, slide later on. But the service is available and ready for production use. What is it? It is uh, the platform that allows you to deliver applications and desktops to the end user. Uh, similar to that NT4 we had, but then based on Windows 10, based on the latest RDP, and based on all of the um, improvement that have been added, obviously, along the way. Um, it allows you to have optimization for Pro Plus, obviously 6.5. Uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, and there are migration scenarios available that allow you to move from an on-prem RDS back or uh, for moving forward to RDS uh, in Azure and eventually Windows Virtual Desktop. And it scales automatically with you. So as we'll see, many of the components are now based uh, on a platform as a service model. Uh, so you don't have to manage and maintain those virtual machines uh, anymore. You can really focus on the end user experience on the session host itself. So switching to that architecture, we can now see that most of the infrastructure components are now in that middle uh, section. So if you're familiar with these, web access, gateway, uh, connection broker, SQL server, they are all part of the Windows Virtual Desktop service managed for you by Microsoft. And on the right hand side is all of the components that are still in your Azure subscription. So these are the session host servers hosting the applications and the desktops. Uh, and some services that are needed to uh, to allow you to have the full environment, so like Active Directory, a file services uh, location, etc. On the left hand side, you have the same clients. So we still have uh, iOS, macOS, Android, HTML5, uh, all of them uh, available. Uh, but for the most part, that this uh, section in the middle, you do not see that in your Azure subscription, and you do, you are not charged for that. And we'll talk about licensing uh, as well. So the only thing you're charged for is the VMs on the right hand side. So the actual session host uh, VMs. Any questions on this architecture before we move on? Anyone here who tried this service? No one? <laughs> you didn't there? OK. <laughs> so it's important to note that uh, Windows Virtual Desktop is based on Azure Active Directory by default. So any uh, previous environment, RDS, they were all based on Active Directory. This is all based on Azure Active Directory, meaning that we can instantly uh, leverage things like multi-factor authentication, conditional access, and all of the benefits that come with Azure AD. You can also apply them to Windows Virtual Desktop. The VMs on the right-hand side, they are still domain joined, and we'll talk about some of the domain joined scenarios uh, in a bit as well. So when the user logs on, let's take a look at the user uh, flow. The user authenticate against the Active Directory of the tenant on the right hand side. And this is where conditional access and MFA is uh, applied. And he then gets presented uh, the applications and desktops that are assigned to him based on group membership or based on authorization uh, in one of the Windows with your desktop clients. He opens up one of those applications, makes a new connection towards the gateway server. Um, and then the connection broker initiates a outbound port from uh, the RDS server back to the Windows Virtual Desktop gateway. And this is something that is new. 
uh, and this is called reverse connect. So that means that the firewall that is in front of your uh, session host VMs in your own Azure subscription can be fully closed for any inbound ports. We do not need any inbound ports for the setup. We are using an outbound port that's initiated by the agent back to the gateway server. Uh, why is it important? Because you have a full separation between anything that is public inside the Windows Spectrum Desktop Service and anything that's your own in your own Azure subscription. One of the other reasons they did this is that this service is fully multi-tenant. So if you are an ISV or an application provider and you want to have your application be provided to multiple customers, you can host your own Windows Virtual Desktop environment in your subscription and provide access to multiple uh, customers in their own isolated Active Directory, their own subscription, uh, fully isolated from any other, uh, anyone else. So that really allows you to have a full multi-tenancy setup, including things like uh, role-based access control and having permissions on each of these levels as well. Extensibility. So in terms of management, they created a REST API on top of this service, which allows you to have PowerShell management, which hopefully we all love because it allows us to do automation, uh, scripting, etc. cetera. Uh, but it also comes with a GUI. So they have been developing a web-based UI based on feedback they still uh, some of us still apparently want a, a web UI available, so that's uh, that's coming as well. Uh, and because this is an open REST API, any third-party vendor can also create their own management UI on top of it. And some uh, have already done this. Uh, they're available. Some of them are community projects. Some of them are paid. Uh, but there's a variety of clients available to manage this environment as well. So identities, we talked about that. Uh, so the, the, um, the session host servers or the Windows 10 VMs that you are running in your subscription for this, they still need to be domain joined. Uh, and these are the options you can select from in terms of uh, domain join. And we'll cover those. So the first one is based on having a domain controller in your own Azure subscription. So this is the most common scenario where you might have still have an on-prem environment. You are uh, slowly lift and shifting towards the Azure cloud. So you're setting up your first domain controller there. Uh, the VMs that are part of your Windows Virtual Desktop environment will authenticate and will join that domain controller in Azure. That's the first option. The second one is based on Azure ADDS, so Azure Active Directory Domain Services. If you are an organization who has already shifted away from traditional AD, maybe you do not have, even have a regular domain controller anymore, you can also use Azure Active Directory out of the box and join the VMs directly to that service without having to run a domain controller. Obviously, uh, that also comes with costs, right? That's not a free service, uh, so be, uh, be aware of that. The third one is hybrid scenarios. Uh, um, I do not see, really see that scenario a lot, but you could have a domain controller on-prem uh, connected over a express route or VPN, side-to-side uh, -side VPN back to Azure, uh, and allow you to have uh, the domain join over that network connection as well, uh, which uh, for which you do not have to set up a domain controller in Azure. But the downside is you are always um, uh, have to rely on the express out in the VPN to be uh, available. So I don't really see that scenario. For most environments that I have built for proof of concept and environment, we're doing uh, this first scenario as well, uh, most of the time. Um, what's coming is that these VMs ultimately will be joined to Azure um, AD directly. Uh, so the ultimate goal is that the Windows 10 or the Windows uh, that you're running for Windows for your desktop will join directly Azure ED without having to worry about uh, domain controllers. But that's all future. Uh, they haven't announced they're working on that, but it's really complex because they have to deal with uh, the product teams from Azure, uh, from AD, from Intune, from Windows 10, uh, but that's coming. Uh, but for now, you have to choose one of these identity platforms. Let's take a look at the object model within Windows Virtual Desktop. Uh, on the highest level, you have something that's called the tenant group. So it's really a group of multiple tenants. And by default, you are always assigned to the one in the middle, which is called the default tenant group, which means that if you create your first Windows Virtual Desktop tenant, and we'll show you that in a demo uh, in just a bit, your tenant will be created under the default tenant group uh, that Microsoft manages. If you are an ISV and you want to have multiple uh, tenants within your own custom uh, tenant group, you can also sign up for one of those uh, in the top row to have your own tenant group and be able to do role-based access control, 
uh, from the tenant group all the way down to uh, all of these objects. But for the most part, you will probably stick to the one in the middle. Underneath the tenant, we have uh, the concept of host pool. If you're familiar with RDS, this is what's called uh, a session collection back in the RDS uh, days. Really a collection of multiple machines hosting the same application and hosting the same uh, workload for the end user. On top of that host portal, well, actually underneath the host pool, you can either have, um, or you have the session host service I just talked about, but also the application groups. So inside an application group, you define which application the user can launch, uh, and the session host that are, that are a member of the host pool define on which machine you will actually be logging on. The app groups can uh, publish remote apps and desktops uh, as well. So although the service is called Windows Virtual Desktop, it also does remote app that sometimes is, uh, is confusing for customers. Uh, but that's what you define on that level uh, as well. And the user session will eventually log on to the session host server, which can be Windows 10, Windows 10 multi-session, or all of the uh, Windows Server editions uh, as well. Operating system, we talked about this. So what has been available for many years on the left hand side is the Windows Server operating system. This allows you to have multiple uh, multiple users connected to the same server, share resources, uh, share CPU, memory, and be able to easily uh, scale. The downside has always been this is uh, Win32 applications only. So no modern apps, uh, no edge available on Windows Server, at least back then. Um, and not really the Windows 10 look and feel that the user is, um, is used to when he has been using Windows 10. On the right hand side, we always had the Windows 10 Enterprise. So the one to one relationship between the user and the VM where each user has his own designated VM, uh, which is Windows 10, which is uh, Win32 and modern apps. But it's complex to set up. It's sort of a VDI scenario where each user has to uh, have his own VM. You need to manage that, maintain that. Uh, it can be really complex if you have a large enterprise. So what they did is they basically created the one in the middle, which is best of both worlds. So this is a combination of Windows Server being able to have multiple users at the same time and the Windows 10. So this is Windows 10 Enterprise multi-user. Uh, it is just Windows 10 underneath at the same uh, SKU, but they allow you to have multiple users RDP into that same machine at the same time. This feature actually has been available since Windows XP, but no, not many people know about that. Uh, but there is a way to change that setting in even inside Windows XP to have multiple users at the same time. What they did here is similar to that technology, uh, but this time it's legal and this time it's uh, you can actually license it uh, on top of Azure. So we'll talk about licensing uh, as well, but I really believe that the one in the middle is going to be the session host of the future. So. Hosting session, uh, sessions on Windows Server will gradually go away uh, because there are many other advantages for, for having Windows 10 as well. For example, if you have an application you're running locally and in Windows Virtual Desktop, you can use the same imaging technology, the same FV sequence or whatever you're using. Uh, and from the user perspective, he just gets Windows 10 as he is uh, used to it on his local machine uh, as well. There's also a licensing benefit, but we'll talk about that later, uh, later on. Any questions about these operating systems? The one question I always get. Sorry? At the moment, how, like, why did you say that the one in the middle is already being deployed in the middle? Yeah, the one in the middle comes with Windows for your desktop. So that's new as part of the Windows for your desktop service, which was launched uh, in October. Uh, but the one question I always get is can I also run that uh, middle operating system on prem? Uh, the answer is no because you have to run that uh, on Azure as part of the Windows Virtual Desktop service. So, you know if that will be uh, available in Azure Stack? Yes, so uh, they recently announced that uh, Azure Stack will be the uh, the first and for at least for now only a way to um, host these operating systems on-prem as well. In that case, you can use uh, Windows 10 multi-session. Yeah. So besides Windows 10 multi-session, this is a list of supported operating systems. So even going back to Windows 7, like we discussed, if you have an application that does not run on Windows 10, you can still use Windows 7 even with Azure and get extended uh, security updates for three years uh, as well. Uh, and also all the Windows Server uh, operating systems. So you can even have a mix between uh, these operating systems in one 
Windows Virtual Desktop uh, environment, which is something that you could not do uh, with regular RDS. You would always stick to the operating system that RDS was built on um, for that environment. So it really allows you to have the flexibility uh, you sometimes need for specific applications or specific use cases. When it comes to VM types, you can basically select any virtual machine type that's available in your region to host your Windows Virtual Desktop workload. So anything from uh, an A series, a D series, even to uh, the more expensive ones, uh, the NV series who have uh, a GPU available that allows you to run even a graphics workload on these uh, virtual machines. So during the um, provisioning of Windows Virtual Desktop, you can just simply select the number of uh, VMs or the number of users and select the Azure uh, sizing uh, as well. So we talked about the host pool being underneath of the uh, tenant. You can either have remote app and desktop. We talked about uh, that. Uh, and there are also different load balancing mechanisms available. So if you have what's called reserved instances in Azure, which means that you pre-purchased a specific uh, Azure uh, VM size, you do not have to worry about costs. You can just leave those VM running 24-7, uh, and you will use the first uh, load balancing mechanism, the ref mode, where each user will be, uh, where uh, the user sessions will be divided over all of the active uh, VMs. If, if you do not have reserved instance, but you're using the pay-per-use model, uh, you have to do something about scaling, because if you run these VMs 24-7, uh, and nobody's using them during the night, that's a waste of money, right? So you have to have scaling available to be able to uh, trim down the number of servers uh, during the night and scale them back up uh, during the morning. In that case, you use the death mode load balancing. Single or uh, multi-user uh, VMs, like we saw, we have uh, the one-to-one -one relationship that's still available for one user for one VM, uh, but also multi-user for all of the operating systems, uh, including Windows 10 now. Uh, and pull the personal. So you can even have a personal VM where each user has his, his own uh, VM, and when he logs on, he will always get that uh, same VM, or you will have a pool of VMs, and the user logs on, and he gets uh, the one VM that's available at that time, uh, and his profile is mounted underneath of there. So each of these options are available uh, as part of the service. We talked about scaling. This is a scaling example we use for a customer during a proof of concept where uh, it's probably not even not really readable, but the blue line is the number of users who are connecting during this proof of concept. So we had about uh, 50 concurrent users uh, at this time. And the orange line is the number of VMs that we had running at that time. So we had a scaling script available that downsized the number of VMs available to uh, a minimum. And in this case, I think one or two uh, VMs uh, to be able to save those costs. So that's available. Uh, there are a couple of sample uh, scripts available on GitHub uh, by Microsoft that you can use and customize to your own needs uh, as well in order to save some of those costs for the Azure uh, VMs and your subscription. Automation. So this gives uh, a couple of links to the uh, GitHub page that Microsoft provides with uh, some of the ARM templates. Uh, I will show you those uh, in a bit as well and a link to the scaling script allowing you to scale those uh, VMs. And also, obviously, a couple of third parties are also diving into this. So they are delivering third party tools on top of that that can help you to scale the VMs and have a, a better user experience uh, altogether. This is a uh, some of the uh, management UI that is coming. So they have a preview available, which does not really look like this, but it's a preview that you can host in your own Azure subscription. Uh, eventually, the Windows Virtual Desktop service will be fully managed within the actual Azure portal. So if you're familiar with the Azure portal, hopefully we all are, uh, you can see that this uh, this is actually uh, the way we uh, we um, have experience with the Azure portal. So the, the naming convention and all of the uh, icons is exactly how you would uh, expect it. There's a preview going on. Yes. For the UI? Yeah, yeah, the UI. Uh, last thing I heard was Q1 uh, next year. That's a rather uh, broad estimate, yeah. but <laughs> I don't know. Uh, what they told me is that they have some challenges uh, with the with the Azure team. They have uh, different uh, things to cover within this UI in terms of uh, the deployment of the VM and the Azure service. So it's 
they're having some troubles uh, getting this inside the Azure portal. But during the Ignite uh, conference. Uh, they actually showed a live demo, so it is already. Uh, so I'm expecting a preview somewhere early uh, next year, and then probably GA at the end of Q1 uh, next year, something like that. But there is, like I said, uh, a sort of limited version of this available. I'm not sure if you've seen it, uh, that has some of the features uh, available today. There are a couple of um, Update rings available, so this is similar to, uh, for example, the Office uh, Windows uh, rings. Um, there is Azure Traffic Manager available and DNS available that, that allow you to uh, redirect your user session to the closest gateway in the closest Windows for your desktop uh, backplane. Um, and it is based on the ring you are in. So by default, you are in uh, ring one, R1, which is secure into a production uh, ring. But there is a way to change your host pool back to uh, from production to validation mode, which allows you to be in ring zero. So if there is an update to the Windows Virtual Desktop service, they will update that first to all of the ring zero uh, deployments. So if you want to have uh, that um, available in your environment uh, at first, uh, you can switch a uh, host pool to that validation mode. Best practice here is that your production workload should be running on production. Uh, but you should also create a smaller validation host pool with a couple of users in it, uh, which allow you to see, um, to have the experience of the new features that are coming out. So, if, for example, if Microsoft is coming out with a new region they are supporting or a new feature within WVD, those test users will get that first before everyone else in the production uh, ring will get that update. These are some of the regions that are available uh, today. So as you can see, um, the, the US and uh, West and North Europe are available. Uh, the initial plan was to have GA available only in the US, uh, but then they take they have taken a look at the number of proof of concepts that were done for Windows Virtual Desktop, and it seemed that West Europe was on number one. So they had no other way of uh, uh, including West Europe into the GA as well. Um, and Japan has also recently been added, and they are working on uh, India, Brazil, and uh, Australia as well. Um, and our other regions will follow uh, along the way. So that does not mean if that you are, for example, in the Africa region that you cannot set up WVD. You can, but the user will make a connection to the closest gateway server and then back to the data center where you are hosting your workloads. So yes, you can connect. So yes, it's available worldwide, like Brad Anderson said, but with some latency if you are connecting uh, over on a gateway server. Questions on this? Is this clear? All right. Yep. Um, but I noticed from, uh, well, I'm from Amsterdam, so I'm close to the West Europe, yeah. <laughs> as close as you can be. Uh, and I reached about uh, 60 milliseconds of uh, round trip latency. Okay. Back when the server was not available uh, in Europe yet, uh, my sessions went um, to East US and then back to my VM in West Europe. I got about 160 milliseconds uh, round trip latency. Nice. There is a website available. The link is a bit, a bit small, uh, but it's aka.ms uh, WVD Experience Estimator. And what it does is allow you to see the, um, the estimated uh, latency for each of the Azure uh, regions. So I'm not sure what to expect from here, um, but I would advise you to see, check out the website and see the, some of the latency uh, there. It will probably be 30-ish, something like that. Okay, ready for the demo? Or any more questions about uh, some of the architecture? Nope. So deploying uh, Windows Virtual Desktop. Um, if you've been uh, to, the, uh, to the Azure portal and you've seen Windows Virtual Desktop, you'll see that there is a wizard available that says, uh, uh, go and click here and deploy your Windows Virtual Desktop environment. So I've seen many customers and many uh, people reach out to me and say, look, I created uh, the WVD service here and it doesn't work. Uh, that's correct because there are a little bit of prerequisites that need to be done before you can create, uh, click create here. And uh, I'll show you some of those. So 
the first thing you actually need to do is you need to browse to this website and I can show if you want as well, which allows me to provide uh, consent to for the Windows Virtual Desktop service. So basically you're saying the Windows Virtual Desktop service is allowing, uh, I allow the Windows Virtual Desktop service to access my, um, uh, my Azure ID to retrieve the information to be able to assign applications. So you need to provide your Azure ID uh, ID here and do that for uh, the client and the server. Uh, second step is then that you need to access uh, the Azure portal and give yourself tenant cr creator permissions. So by default, if you go to the um, enterprise applications, you have the Windows or Desktop uh, enterprise application available. Um, you, you will only have default access here. So if you see uh, the roles that are assigned, uh, this is the role you need to assign to yourself to be able to create your own uh, Windows with your desktop tenant. So basically you add your own user account and you provide your own yourself with the tenant creator. Step number uh, three is then creating the service principle. This is not mandatory. If you want to have uh, your own admin account for this service, you can also do that. But the downside is that if you have MFA on top of your admin account, and hopefully you do, uh, that will not work. So most of the times what I advise is creating a service principle in the Azure portal uh, and then providing the service principle with the permissions to create your host pools and your environment and start using that account instead of your own uh, personal admin account. Then step number four is creating the actual tenant. So you cannot do that from the Azure portal yet. So you have to run this command new RDS tenant with a name with an Azure ID ID subscription ID and uh, for example, a uh, description as shown here. And then you are provided with uh, your first WVD tenant. Those four steps need to be done before you can actually run uh, the wizard we saw before. So let's go back to that wizard. If I go uh, and click uh, create here, there's a four step wizard. Um, that takes me through the deployment of uh, Windows Virtual Desktop. So the first step is that I need to provide uh, some details about uh, my um, my subscription and my uh, host pool. So I need to provide my subscription name, the resource group in which I want to deploy this, the region where I want to deploy this, uh, and um, the desktop type. So this can be pooled or personal, so designated VMs or sharing uh, VMs. And I need to provide what's called a service metadata location. This can only be uh, US at the moment, which means that some of the metadata is still stored in the US regions only. Uh, that will uh, gradually go to other regions uh, as well, uh, but does not really affect the user experience. Uh, does not affect the user experience, I should say. Yes. Yeah, good question. Uh, it will move automatically, but uh, the data that is stored here is is not really uh, data that's saved. It's all about uh, some of the session data, telemetry. Uh, so you can you can just actually remove it and recreate it. it doesn't affect user experience. Uh, but yeah, that will move along to the regions uh, closest to you. Yeah. Most of this data is actually used by Microsoft themselves. So they have some telemetry data available about uh, the usage, about the locations where people are connecting from, the latency that was measured, uh, et cetera. Second step is then uh, configuring the virtual machines. We've seen that screenshot uh, before. This is where you provide uh, the usage profile. You can select from light, medium, uh, and heavy. I strongly, uh, strongly advise you to not use this uh, this way of calculating the number of, of VMs, uh, because this estimate here is uh, slightly optimistic by Microsoft. Um, but I also, uh, what I always encourage you to do is use uh, and make sure that you provide the number of uh, VMs. So as soon as I select uh, custom here, this number of uses changes to number of virtual machines, and I can specify I want 100 machines of a specific type, and the host pool will deploy that number of VMs. If I would select, uh, a, for example, a medium workload here, you can see that the estimate changes to uh, X number of uh, VMs. But again, 
do not look at this estimate. This is really um, a ballpark uh, figure, so to say. Last thing you can specify here is the virtual machine prefix. So because this, in this case, will deploying 100 VMs, but if I select uh, 10 here, it will deploy 10 VMs. You need a prefix to be able to create the VM, so the VM name. So for example, something like uh, WVD-environment-and then the number. What the service will do is the first VM will be uh, dash one, dash two, dash zero uh, going forward. Then some of the virtual machine uh, settings, specifically for uh, the VM itself. What I can specify here is uh, the operating system, and I have available uh, Windows 10 Enterprise, even with Pro Plus uh, pre-configured or pre-installed on it. Uh, regular multi-session Windows Server uh, versions. For the most environments, you will probably want to refer to a managed image. So in this case, I have deployed a VM in Azure before. I have installed my application landscape in it. I have uh, captured the VM back to a image, and I provide the image name and the resource uh, group here. Uh, uh, and optionally, you can also have uh, that same story, but then for uh, the regular blob storage. This is also where you provide the uh, AD domain credentials. So be sure to specify a service account here that is allowing you to join these virtual machines to the domain in the OU. So if I specify yes here, I can specify uh, the domain to join to, but also optionally the OU path inside my AD where these VMs are going to be uh, created. And the last step is then uh, providing the uh, network details. So obviously I need a virtual network and a subnet where these VMs will be uh, joined to. Uh, there is an option to create a new uh, VNet as part of this wizard, but that doesn't work. So always create a VNet and a subnet first and then start to deploy the service. The last step is then providing some of the WVD specific information. Uh, and this is where you specify uh, that default tenant group. Remember that uh, hierarchy we had with uh, tenant group, tenant, host pool. This is that name. So if you do, if you did not request a uh, tenant group yourself, always select default tenant group here, and then provide the tenant name. So the PowerShell command we just had to create a tenant. That's the name you provide here, uh, including the service principle we talked about for the uh, the scaling and the deployment of the service. And that's basically it. So after these four steps, you get uh, the review and create, and the service will then deploy in your Azure subscription. It takes about 20, 30 minutes uh, to complete, depending on the number of VMs, depending on the image you selected, how, how big that image uh, is. But after that, the end result, let's take a look uh, at that, is a resource group where uh, the VMs are hosted as part of this service. So uh, all of the infrastructure components we talked about, uh, connection brokering, web access, gateway, you do not see those in your, in your Azure subscription. You only see uh, the VMs. Oh, this is the wrong one. You only see the VMs that are part of um, your host pool. So in this case, I recreated a host pool with a single uh, VM. So that's the only object that I see here. This is a VM that's running in my Azure subscription, part of my Azure domain, uh, but published through the public uh, WVD service. So this is just a regular ISVM that we are uh, used to. And you can see that uh, it used um, the naming convention and added a dash uh, zero as well. Small uh, tip, do not add that dash in uh, the naming convention because it does that, um, the service does that itself. So if you add a dash, it will be dash dash zero. I've been there, I've done that. So make sure to remove that dash uh, in your naming convention. That's the admin side. Before we move to the client, any questions about this deployment process? No? For the clients, there are a couple of available. This is the Windows, uh, oh, sorry, this is the Windows client that is available. It's an MSI installer. Um, and it provides you a way to uh, sign up for the service. So I uh, already signed up with my test account uh, here. And here you can see that I have a couple of remote apps and a couple of full desktops uh, assigned to me. And when I open this up, and I already did that because we had some challenges with the uh, Wi-Fi, I already opened up the, the full desktop uh, here. So hopefully that'll work a little bit. So this is that Windows 10 multi-session uh, available for my end user. 
Uh, and as you can see, this is just a regular Windows uh, 10, uh, but this time available for the end user with all of the applications uh, in it. So including the Office Suite and all of the other applications that you installed in the image that are now available uh, for this end user. Um, the other option is using a um, remote app, and I did not pre-launch this, so let's uh, Let's just see what happens. So let's open up the, uh, for example, pane application. So we're using the same Windows Virtual Desktop service, the same gateway service. So this one is now connecting back probably to uh, West uh, Europe to my VM, opening up the session and then opening up um, the remote app. And if you're familiar with the remote app concept, you'll probably know that uh, you will not be shown a full desktop, but rather only a single application that integrates into your local machine. Uh, at least that is what should happen. It's always great to do a live demo. Let's try that again. So the first application you, you launch uh, does the session log on as well. Any second or third application uses the same uh, the same uh, session. So here's that remote app available. Obviously there is some latency due to well this. Not so good Wi-Fi, uh, but you get the idea that uh, this is all touch, right? This is the modern look and feel of an application you are uh, used to, but then not lo uh, not locally running, but uh, hosted in Azure as part of the Windows Virtual Desktop service. So you can also interact uh, with this and do um, switch between local and remote app applications, have uh, clipboard redirection available, USB redirection, audio redirection. That's all available for the client as well. The only way really to tell that this is a remote app is by this really small uh, RDB uh, glyph icon on top of uh, the icon in the taskbar, indicating that this is actually a remote app and not installed locally. So this is the uh, Windows client, and there's one available for iOS, macOS, Android uh, in the various app stores as well, including a full HTML5 client uh, that you can run in your browser as well. Questions on the clients? Uh, one one question. Do you know if this technology is used for Visual Studio Code on Mac? Any idea? Visual Studio Code Online. Yeah. Why? No, I'm just, just oh. thinking because because now we can run Visual Studio Code online through uh, HTTP or, or HTML. Uh -huh. And it uses uh, uh, virtual or uses a desktop to publish it, but they don't say what kind of technology is pushing the 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 HTML5 the window. Application itself. Yeah, there's a good chance that that is actually the WVD service underneath. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure, but uh, just, yeah, it's a good chance. Yeah. How much time do we have? Uh, Sorry? Uh, seven minutes. <laughs> okay. I, um, let me go through one of the more uh, important slides uh, as well. I did have some stuff about uh, logic, so let's see if we can uh, get to that uh, as well. It's important to mention the, the licensing. So there is no such thing as a WVD license uh, per user or anything else, uh, like the RDS Cal uh, used to be. If your user has one of these Windows uh, licenses, you are eligible of using the WVD service. So the entire Windows for your desktop service is quote unquote free as long as your user has one of these licenses. If you are still using the Windows Server operating system, you still have to use an RDS Cal, uh, the client access license, to be able to uh, to license that. So this is another reason to start using. Windows 10 multi-session, uh, obviously. Does it actually check? If you have a license, yeah. not yet. Yeah. <laughs> but don't tell anyone. <laughs> no, the, the, the check isn't in there yet, um, but yeah, I shouldn't be saying that. <laughs> uh, in regards to pricing, if you're familiar with the Azure pricing of any uh, VM, the one in red is the regular price that you need to pay per month uh, for these uh, VM sizes. So I had a, a subset of uh, a couple of B and D series uh, VMs. If you are running with VMs as part of the Windows Virtual Desktop service, you get that extra discount because you're not paying for the Windows license. 
So they also they also uh, call this uh, the Linux uh, pricing model, which is a significant uh, amount. For example, the the one in red here, the D4 uh, V3 one, which is uh, well almost 50% or 40% of uh, the regular VM uh, price. Uh, and this excludes things like uh, the sizing or the pre-purchasing, uh, etc. So be aware that that uh, needs to be in place. If you deploy Windows with your desktop service, that pricing tag is automatically applied. If you do not do that using the Azure portal, it is not. So make sure that you change the VM to that licensing model in order to get that uh, pricing discount as well. Real quick about FS Logics. Who has heard about it? A couple of people. They were acquired by Microsoft uh, November last year. Uh, and this is uh, a subset of the reasons uh, why. They have a te technology that allows you to have uh, the best Office Pro Plus environment or experience within a virtualized environment. Why? Because they cache all of the uh, Outlook, OneNote, OneDrive uh, uh, data inside a VHDX file uh, and mount that underneath the user's uh, profile. So they uh, allow you to have uh, a similar uh, office experience that you are used to uh, locally as well. And it's available uh, for free. So if, if you are using Windows with, the, Windows with the desktop, or even regular RDS on-prem, uh, you can also start using this, uh, this service. It's available on the Microsoft side uh, already, so that integration did already uh, take place. So the profile is, um, it's basically a VHDX file on a file share or a piece of uh, blob storage that is mounted underneath the profile location. So the, the default profile location is uh, C user's username. Instead of having a local or roaming profile there, a VHDX file is mounted underneath that location, resulting that uh, any uh, read or write action that you do to the, towards the profile is not happening locally on the session host server, but happening inside that uh, mounted VHDX file. Um, I was going to show you a demo, so let's uh, take a little bit of fast forward. One thing that I did want to mention that is, uh, has been announced at uh, Ignite is something that's called uh, AppAttach, which is based on the MSIX packaging uh, format. So in the past, when we are looking, I'm oh, sorry, and we're looking at doing applications inside these environments. So this applies to RDS, Citrix, uh, or uh, VMware, or whatever you're using. Basically, you have three different options. Option one is you cram all of your applications in one image and have multiple image for each of your workloads, in each of your session collections. Uh, it can be a challenge depending on your application landscape. It might also uh, be uh, applicable, uh, but you end up with multiple uh, images that you need to manage and maintain. Second option is using uh, app layering. So in this case, you're installing all of your applications into a single image and then using masking technology to mask a specific application for a specific uh, user group. Depending on the use case, it could also work. Uh, and a third one is using app streaming. So this is your app V or similar uh, technology. These three are not new. This is the way we've been doing, uh, we've been dealing with application landscapes uh, for these environments for many years. What is announced uh, now is uh, called app attach. So we had that profile technology uh, where the user's profile was attached based on a VHDX file. This is a similar thing, but then for the application itself. So rather than talking about it, let's do a quick demo. How long do you have yet, like time-wise? I, I still want to go on stage and talk to you guys about uh, It's about 45 minutes. So he's done 45 minutes. He started yeah, 45 minutes ago. Oh, okay. So, okay. Oh, that was wrong. So here I have that same uh, Windows 10 multi-session uh, desktop. And if I go to the uh, start menu and start looking for Notepad, I only have Notepad, the regular one available. There's no Notepad++ here. Um, and if I run AppAttach, and this is all based on preview technology, so this requires me now to run a PowerShell command, but eventually this will integrate into the Windows desktop service. It takes a couple of seconds to uh, complete. And if I now go back to the start menu, sorry, start menu, oh. we have the application available. So it, is, it, was not, it was not installed on this machine, it was attached on this machine and it's directly accessible uh, for the end user to start using it. 
So the end user does not see the difference. It seems like a locally installed application, but it's mounted underneath this uh, VM. Um, and similarly, I could also detach that application. Obviously, you would not do that live during a session, uh, but the application is now gone and it's uh, removed from the start menu. So just to show you what's coming with app attached later on, allowing you to deal with application landscapes in a more easy way. Let me fast forward to the last slide to allow enough time for the next uh, presenter uh, as well. Um, this is, uh, these are some of the announcements that were made uh, at Ignite uh, in Orlando in regards to Windows Virtual Desktop, uh, the service. So everything that I showed you just now is uh, available, uh, except for the app attach. And this was what has been announced on top of that. So a support for the Linux and clients, the app attach I just showed you, uh, on-premises workloads so that you just uh, mentioned as well. The backplane being now deployed in other regions, uh, support for Azure files with Azure um, with, uh, Active Directory, uh, an important one, Teams audio video support. So if you have a full desktop with uh, the full uh, office experience in it, uh, the experience of using audio and video over RDP is still not that good, uh, but they are coming with a Teams uh, audio and video support that redirects that stream back to your local machine, allowing you to have a better Teams uh, performance. Uh, so migration tools from moving to existing profiles towards FS Logic profile containers and a personal desktop assignment, allowing you to assign a specific desktop to a specific user. That was it. Uh, we'll leave the questions for now. I'll be here uh, the rest of the evening uh, as well. So if you want to talk about this uh, some more, uh, feel free. And uh, well, thank you for your attention. Yeah, sure, right? Bit of a rush, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. 